special treat this morning again. You know, uh, a couple years ago, we had a, a, a meeting. And you know how at those long all-day meetings, sometimes you have somebody do a little devotion at the beginning? Seldom is the devotion the best part of the meeting. But this time it was because the friend that was doing it was Zina Shock. Zina Shock is a woman who loves God and who loves kids. And I want you to welcome her as a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Zina Shock. it among the saints of God, just to be in the number. God is a good God. God is an awesome God. And and for teaching and that is meant to equip us thoroughly for the word. And the Mark text does something different than all of the other texts. You see that story of a woman anointing Jesus is in every single gospel. In Luke they make my sister a sinner. And I have you know the Luke text does not call her a prostitute, but we certainly like to. You don't 
know what her sin was. Who calls her a sinner and brings her to Jesus' feet? And he teaches a parable about forgiveness through her action. That's the Lucan text. And then you get the Matthew text where we don't know her name. And we don't know if she's a sinner or not. But she comes and again she anoints his head. And it's the Matthew text where the disciples get in her way. And then we come to the John text and to the Mark text. John text names her for us. She's Mary of Bethany. You know Mary and Martha. You know Lazarus' sister. And in the John text, she anoints him, and we don't know why, but he raised her brother the chapter before. So I imagine she just come to anoint him just to say, thank you, Lord, for giving my brother his life. Thank you, Lord, for not hurrying so you could do your work in your time. Thank you, Lord, for calling me out to meet you and to honor us with your presence. comes and that is the only book, the only gospel where she breaks the Bible. I don't care okay, whether you read John or Luke or Matthew, she doesn't break the box in those two. It's only in Mark. She comes to Jesus and she breaks the box in his feet and begins to anoint his head. Now, in the first century Jerusalem, that action had meaning. And see, we live so many centuries away. We don't always understand the text, but Jeremiah Wright, one of the pastors in my life, said, you, if you take a text out of context, it's a pretext. So you've got to put the text in its context to understand what the text is saying to our hearts. In first century Jerusalem, when a woman was born, the parents were able, they found an alabaster box for her. It was a box of marble, a small box. Typically, but the richer you were, the larger your box. But when you were a small girl child, your parents bought you this box. And all through your life, you would take every little penny, every little mite, everything you could get your hand on that you didn't have to spend for your living. And you would buy oil and put in your box. And every drop of oil that went into that box was a dream. It was a dream for a happy household. It was a dream for a marriage to a good man. It was a dream for prosperity. It was a dream for a good life. Every little girl had an alabaster box. Every little girl put her dreams in that alabaster box represented by the oil. And we know the oil is the Holy Spirit. But in that time, it was putting your dreams in the box. When that faithful day came, and in that time, it was about 13 or 14 or 15 years of age, of age when that day came, and your parents had found for you the one you were to marry. Your parents had brought to you this man who was going to be the rule of your life from then on. When your parents had found for you the one that they thought would help your dreams come true, you came to him and bowed at his feet and broke your box at his feet. And see, when you broke your box, it meant that nothing else could go in it. When you broke your box, all of your dreams came spilling out. When you broke your box, you were saying, I'm giving you everything I have. You've got to take care of me. I don't have any more property. I don't have any more rights. You're not my husband. You've got to take care of me. Oh, when you broke your box, you can never put it back together. All your stuff started spilling out, and it was now in the hands of this man. She broke her box in Jesus' feet. My sister brought her box in, in her mind and in her heart and in her day. It was giving Jesus all she had. It was saying to him, I'm coming to you with my life, whether she's a sinner or not, because the word said all have sinned and come short. She brought her box to his feet and said, I can only give you what little I have, but I'm giving it to you because I trust you. I'm giving it to you because I don't think you'll hurt me. I'm giving it to you because I believe you love me. I'm giving it to you because I believe you'll take care of me. Jesus, I'm going to break my box at your feet. Jesus, you have to bring your dreams. You see, there's a 
trick of the enemy to tell us we have no dreams. It's a trick of the enemy to coerce your dreams and to make it look as if they won't succeed. It's a trick of the enemy when people tell you that your dreams are no good. It's a trick of the enemy that, that when they tell you that because of your address or because of your messed up life or because of the mistakes you've made that you don't deserve to have dreams. It's a trick of the enemy. No, Psalm 37 forces the light in the Lord and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. Oh, but if we're going to come to Jesus, we have to come with our dreams. And I'm not talking about that little dream. I'm not talking about that right now dream. I'm not talking about that dream of taking one thing from this conference and going home and applying it. I'm talking about kingdom-shaking dreams. I'm talking about dreams that are bigger than Pentecost. I'm talking about dreams that revive not only a city or state, but a nation. I'm talking about dreams that will revive that person who lives in your household, whom you're afraid to talk to and bring the gospel to. Those are the kinds of dreams some of us have been praying the same dream for 40 years. I'm 43. I may be one of you. Over 10 years, or for five years. But you see, you've got to bring the dreams to Jesus. And what I like about the Lord, Dr. Brachester, you said it yesterday, is he doesn't see us as we are. He sees us as we're meant to be. That's why he said to get in, almighty man of war, when he was down in a hole. Talk about you got the wrong address, God. God sees us not as we are, but as we're meant to be. And God sees our dreams not as they are, but how they are as they're meant to be. And in His Word, He said, "You do greater things than even I do." Oh, you gotta have a dream, and you know that thing, that thing that won't leave you alone, that thing that's been in your heart and keeps rising up, that thing that when you're in that morning time, when all is gray, you can. Feel it. It's ethereal, but you know it's there. It's that thing that you keep hearing a word of prophecy about in your life, but you won't accept it. And I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about us. God told me for years I was supposed to go to seminary, but I had come up to the church where women were not ordained. The man who baptized me will still not call me Reverend. Bless his heart. I still love him. But that dream stayed there until one day, Dr. Tulare, God got in my car too, on Route 780 between Oakland and Sacramento. And said, are you tired of running yet? Oh, and I looked in my rearview mirror because I assumed he was in the back seat. I must be chauffeuring God. And said to him, Lord, don't you know about my life? See, there are things I'll tell God, but I can't tell you. I can remind you, God, about a night in Texas when you know what happened. I can remind you, God, about a night in Evanston when you know what happened. Lord, you can't walk me in God said, I see you, God, I'm not as you are. Oh, but as I called you to be, what's your dream? What's that thing that bubbles up in you and you just won't admit? What's that thing that you're afraid to speak life into, but you know God has given it to you? Oh, if you're going to come to Jesus, bring all of your dreams. Do you think God is so weak that he can't meet your needs? Do you think he's so frail that he can't understand your dreams? My sister in Mark 14 brought all of her dreams to Jesus' feet. And the first thing we can learn from this sister is that you and I have to bring our dreams to Jesus' feet. There's something else we learn from my sister in Mark 14. You see, it is in the Matthew text when it's the disciples who block away. When you get ready to bring your dreams, there's a folk who will block your way. And sometimes they have titles out in the world. They're supervisors and they're bosses and they're professors. Sometimes the people who block our dreams are the ones to whom we report or have some kind of secular power over us. Oh, but I like the Matthew text because sometimes the people who, who block our dreams are called reverend. Sometimes they're called deacon. Sometimes they're called elder. Sometimes they're called bishop. Make no mistake about it. All men and women are human. And sometimes the folk who block your dreams, it breaks your heart. They're the ones who should be standing beside you. They're the ones who should be lifting you up in prayer. They're the ones who should be exhorting and encouraging you. And instead they stand like, who do you think you are? Ain't got a degree from seminary. Here are all of mine. Haven't been in the world long enough. Here's my age. No different. In the ninth chapter of Matthew, you have the disciples, I mean, the disciples blocking the woman with an issue of blood from coming. In the ninth chapter of Mark, they fight over who is going to be the greatest. In the ninth chapter of, of Acts, Paul is breathing out murderous threats all through the biblical record. Those whom God used often have blockages of the brain and of the spirit. Oh, if you're going to have a dream, if you're going to bring your alabaster 
box to Jesus in the street. Sometimes you just have to press through the mess. Sometimes you have to press through the tradition. Sometimes you have to press through the evil. Sometimes you have to press through the jealousy. Sometimes you have to press through the hurt. Sometimes you have to press through the anger. But you've got to press. You see, my sister didn't belong in that room with Jesus. And her day, women couldn't even come and dine with men. I'm sure she met cross arms at the front door, but she didn't let it stop her. She knew she had a mission before God. She knew she had something she needed from the master. And not even the head head Negroes were going to stop her from getting her way to the master's feet. She pressed through the mess. She did not give up. She did not let somebody say, I know more than you. And she turned and ran. She stood flat footed and pressed through the mess if you're going to have dreams.
is an offer of life, love, and living in marriage, in relationship. All of the symbolism tied up in that box was clear to her in every kind of way. He took her off her like a trick. of 
your children. No. Not wait, not baby. No. We do our dreams. And he honors the sincere desires of our heart. I'm not telling you not to bring your dreams. Don't misunderstand me. Bring them. Bring them boldly before the throne of grace. Bring them with everything you have. And lay them at his feet and then say, Lord, do with them and me. What you will. See, we sing songs in church all the time, and I'm about to take my seat. And we sing them, and we don't mean them. We sing all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I, whatever love and trust him in his presence, daily live. All to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Let me feel thy love and power, and let thy blessings fall on me. And then mad. When Jesus says, you're mine. To do with as I please. Not your will, but mine. In your seat when you came in here this morning was a little card. And on that card it says, Lord, I lay this box with all of its dreams at your feet. Do it in and me what you will. We have many folk in here to do an altar call. And let me tell you what I want you to do as my brother Bill begins to play our surrender on. I want you to call that dream to mind. I don't know what it is. It's none of my business. I want you to call that dream to mind. I want you to hold that hand card in your hand. And the Spirit is telling me that there's somebody in here who doesn't yet know what that dream means. There's somebody in here seeking their dream. Hold that card in your hand. It's just a symbol. Nothing magic about it. Nothing religious about it. It's just a symbol. Hold it in your hand. God, all these symbols. And if you don't know your dream,